In a world of prog rock, losing both your guitarist and drummer might spell disaster for most bands. But for the band UK, it became the turning point that led to the album Danger Money. It's an album where they boldly ditched the guitar altogether and pushed their sound into new uncharted territory. So, with just three members left, including Eddie Jobson's virtuosic keyboard and violin work, they crafted a powerful and intricate farewell to the golden age of progressive rock. So this wasn't just survival, it was a reinvention. And the result is a masterpiece that deserves really a closer look. Let me take you back to 1979 for a moment and picture this. Prog rock is at the crossroads with bands either pushing into new experimental territories or simplifying their sound to appeal to a wider audience. And right in the middle of this transition, you have the band UK. These were a group of guys that were carrying the classic torch of progressive rock sound. Now today, I want to dive into their second studio album, Danger Money. It's an album that not only represents a change for the band, but also marks the end of an era for prog rock itself. Released in 1979, just a year after UK's self-titled debut album, and while that first record had a quartet lineup with Alan Holsworth on guitar and Bill Bruford on drums, by the time they got around to this album, the band was down to just a trio. John Wetton was the bassist and vocalist you might know him from his time in King Crimson, and Eddie Jobson, the keyboard and violin maestro. They were still there, but Holsworth and Bruford had departed. Now, the story behind that split is pretty classic when it comes to band dynamics. Wetton and Jobson, the core songwriters, had a bit of a clash with Holdsworth over the musical direction. Holdsworth's jazz-infused guitar style was amazing, but Wetton and Jobson were looking for something really a, a little more structured. Now, Bruford, who was about as legendary as it gets when it comes to progressive drumming, didn't stick around either. Instead, he went off and formed his own jazz fusion group, appropriately named Bruford, taking Holdsworth along for the ride. So what do UK do? They bring in Terry Bozio, who you might recognise from Frank Zappa's band. Bozio is a monster behind the drum kit and an absolute powerhouse, but he's a different kind of drummer compared to Bruford. Bozio is more straightforward, more rock orientated. And that shift is reflected in the music on Danger Money. The album feels tighter, punchier, uh, but less free-flowing than the debut, and, and that's partly because of Bozio's approach. The band also decided to ditch the guitar altogether, and this was really a bold move, but it put forward Eddie Johnson front and centre, both on the keys and violin. And let me tell you, Jobson absolutely delivers on this album. Let's break down some of the tracks. Now the title track, Danger Money, kicks things off really with a massive bang. It's got this huge almost orchestral feel to it right from the start and Jobson's keyboards are really all over it. He's the driving force here, building those huge soundscapes that feel really more grandiose than anything you've heard on the first album. You can tell right away that this is going to be really a more direct, focused record. There's still plenty of twists and turns in the arrangement, but it's got a clarity that UK didn't always have with the original album. Next up is Rendezvous 6.02. Now this is where you really start to hear the pop influences creeping in. Now I don't mean pop in the sense of top 40 radio. It's still a prog rock song through and through, but it's more melodic, more accessible. The electric piano, played in quite a jazzy style, gives the song a softer touch, or Jobson's synth work simply adds layers of depth as the song builds. John Wetton's vocals here are really strong too, and there's this emotional pull that reminds me of his ballads from King Crimson. But the real meat of the album is in the longer, more complex tracks. Now the one called The Only Thing She Needs is a standout for a couple of reasons. First, you get a taste of Bozio's drumming, right at the beginning. It's clear he's taking a more direct, hard-hitting approach than Bruford Worth. The track is dominated by Jobson again, with 
these fantastic keyboard and violin parts that really dance around Wetton's bass lines. What is interesting is that this song was already part of their live set before they recorded it. So you can hear that it's been really fine-tuned. It's intricate without being overwhelming, and the interplay between the band members is just top-notch. Then there's Caesar's Palace Blues, which, as the name suggests, is one of the more aggressive tracks on the album. Jobson's violin here is absolutely wild. It's almost like he's using it as a substitute for a lead guitar, and it works. The song has this frenetic energy to it, driven by Bozio's drumming and Wetton's bass. There's a, a bit of a jazzy feel to this one, but it's more rock than anything else. It's got this edge to it that's a little different from the other tracks. John's vocals here are forceful, giving the song really quite a bit of bite to it. Now the track Nothing To Lose is an interesting track because it's the most commercial sounding song on the album. This was the track that actually got some radio play back in the day. It's not bad, but if I'm being honest, it's probably one of the weakest songs on the album. It's a little too straightforward, a little too safe compared with the rest of the material. But what's interesting is that this song kind of foreshadows where Wetton was heading with Asia, a band that, as you know, would go on to have huge success with more radio-friendly arena rock songs in the 1980s. Finally, we come to the epic of the album, Carrying No Cross. Now, every great prog album needs a big, sprawling track like this, and UK delivers the nine-minute journey that showcases everything great about the band. Jobson's keyboards are front and centre again, so the song goes through these dramatic shifts in mood and tempo. It's almost symphonic in structure with this beautiful build-up to a powerful climax. You can tell this was designed to blow people away in a live setting. Wetton's vocals are fantastic here, and it's the kind of track that makes you realise why people consider Eddie Jobson one of the unsung heroes of prog rock. Now, I have to say this album doesn't get enough credit for me. Sure, it didn't have the impact of Close to the Edge or Selling England by the Pound, but, and it's a big but, Danger Money is a real hidden gem in the prog rock canon. It's also that turning point for UK, as we said, because after this they would disband and we'd see the end of that golden era of progressive rock. Wetton went on to form Asia, and we all know how that turned out. Yes, Genesis, they all moved towards a more commercial sound in the 80s. So in a way, this album here, Danger Money, is a, a swan song for that era of prog. It's the last gasp of that classic, virtuosic, experimental spirit that simply defined the genre in the 1970s. Now, if I had to sum it up, I'd probably say Danger Money is an album that captures a band at the peak of their powers, just before everything changed. It really is a must listen for anyone who loves progressive rock, and even though it's not perfect, it comes pretty damn close. If you're a fan of King Crimson, yes, or ELP, there's no reason why this album shouldn't be in your collection. It's bold, it's ambitious, and most importantly, it's a testament to what made prog rock great in the first place. All right, that's it for today. If you haven't listened to Danger Money in a while, go give it a spin. Let me know what you think in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye for now.